First of all, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you again for joining in tonight, Zooming in. Uh, first thing I want to do is wish everyone a happy Memorial Day weekend. It's not only was it a beautiful, gorgeous day today, but the outlook for the weekend is just as nice. And I hope you all are able to get out there and enjoy it. It's uh, just a gorgeous day. Uh, a couple of announcements. The burn ban has been lifted. It, if you need uh, you want a burn permit, you need to go through the normal process, call the fire warden, and that's either uh, Gordy Smith or uh, uh, Gary Underwood, and they'll issue a fire permit. But there's uh, the burn ban has been lifted. Uh, Lamoille Field Days. Good morning, doctor. Or good evening, good doctor. Lamoille Field Days has been canceled, uh, and that was if if you listen to the governor's address news conference today uh, for the immediate future, all fairs and, and field days are canceled as well. Uh, outdoor restaurant seating is open as of tonight. And uh, a week from now, we'll be able to once again get a haircut, which is good news for a lot of us. Uh, some good news, really good news. NVU president, Elaine Collins is going to stay with us. So that is really good news. I'm glad to hear her stay. Um, we're very happy to have her. Pastor Al from the Nazarene Church is got a hold of me a week ago or so, and they are going to be exploring doing some drive-in service. As you know, drive-ins were opened up about a week or two ago. Green Up is still a go from May 30th, a week from uh, today, uh, tomorrow, next weekend. Uh, the Lamoille Union, the food distribution that was conducted today up at Lamoille Union High School, I talked to Roger and he said it was, he estimated well over a thousand cars, definitely a need in the local area. Uh, we're going to explore doing something along those lines with Johnson Emergency Management. That's about all I have for announcements, and I will turn it over to Meredith Dolan for some village announcements. So I just wanted to remind everybody, um, as for village voters and village residents, um, that the annual village meeting that should have taken place in early April has been canceled, obviously. Um, and all of the village elections, so village officers plus the budget, um, will be conducted by Australian ballot this year. Um, if you haven't yet received it, um, you should be getting in the mail both a paper ballot, um, so you can vote by mail, as well as the village annual report, which includes the budget um, and other reports from village departments. Um, we strongly encourage anybody who is able um, and willing to vote by mail to do so. Uh, we are required to provide in-person voting, and that's going to occur on June 2nd. Uh, but we, you know, to protect village staff and the elections officials, we really are encouraging anybody who's able to vote by mail um, to do so. Um, and please let us know if you have any questions about that or if you need a ballot. Um, and lastly, I just want to remind folks that we do have a pre-vote informational meeting next Tuesday, um, so uh, the day after Memorial Day on Tuesday the 26th, um, and that is required uh, informational meeting about the elections and the budget, um, and that will occur at 6 o'clock via Zoom, same uh, way you logged in for this meeting, same uh, meeting ID. Um, so if you're here, you can certainly participate in that meeting as well, and we'll answer any questions folks have about the village budget uh, or the ballot questions. Um, there is a ballot question on there about a GMP project, uh, electric department project um, that uh, requires voter approval. Um, and so we can certainly provide more information about that ballot question at the informational meeting. And there'll be some information about that coming out on uh, Facebook, from Porch Forum, and our website soon, um, just in case folks have questions about that ballot question. So thanks, Eric. Thank you, Meredith. Well, I don't think I've ever heard this before, a officer in the state government being referred to as a rock star, but tonight's featured speaker is uh, what I've heard on numerous occasions referred to as a Vermont rock star. Uh, it's with great pleasure that I'm able to introduce and welcome to the Johnson Community Zoom tonight, Dr. Mark Levine, who's the Commissioner of Health. Go ahead, Dr. Levine, and thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, I, um, I'd love to know where that got started. 
I shudder to think it might be the secretary that I report to. Uh, but we'll see. Um, I want to be respectful of time and especially want to make this interactive. So I will keep my comments uh, within the constraints of 10 or 15 minutes, I hope. Um, I was kind of asked to speak about how things are going in Vermont. Uh, what strategy do we use to get to where we are now? What strategy do we use to get to where we want to go? Um, what the new normal is in terms of how we all have to behave and how long that might last? And what do I think the future might bring? Does that sound like a good uh, constellation of things to touch on? So sure let's, let's start with uh, the strategy to get to where we are now. Um, and that makes me go beyond Vermont to the world, really. As we all know, this coronavirus began in Wuhan, China, began to spread through Asia, then began to spread through Europe, and then made it to our country a little bit later. Although, as we're learning now, perhaps a lot sooner than we thought, because now we're discovering that it was probably present and even perhaps causing some deaths in states like New York and California and Washington uh, earlier than uh, we first thought. But certainly our experience in Vermont picked up around the beginning of March, even though we've been very surveillant up until that time. And we had our first case uh, at the end of the first week of March. At that time, <clears throat> the United States had woefully uh, almost no capacity for testing, had woefully under reserves of what's called PPE, personal protection equipment, and from a national standpoint, did not have a national coherent strategy for how to deal with what truly is and was subsequently labeled a pandemic. Um, so we had all those factors in the background as we began to encounter the disease. I say all this not to point fingers or to assign blame, but because the principle of public health when one encounters a virus like this is initially to do what's called containment. And containment means you have the ability to test people to identify who's infected by the virus. You then can isolate those people. You can then contact trace around them to find out who they had contact with and who might be currently harboring infection. And you might actually figure out where they acquired it in the first place. And then of course, once you find the people you contact trace, you quarantine them just in case they develop symptoms of the disease so they're out of circulation, not able to spread the virus further. Because indeed, this is a very infectious virus. You know, one person has the ability to rapidly infect between two and three people, and then that keeps multiplying in an exponential fashion so that pretty soon you have a large portion of your population getting infected before they even knew about it. And then, as we've learned with this virus, if it has the ability to, in some people, cause no symptoms, in other people, to be able to infect people, even though the person who has it isn't yet symptomatic, and it's usually a 48 hour period that may go by where they have no symptoms, but just talking to you could infect you. Uh, that really creates a tremendous issue from a health standpoint across the public, because then you really don't know, unless you've been doing contact tracing, who to isolate out from who. Our experience in Vermont uh, was related to disease coming in across our borders, sometimes from states around us, other times coming in through the airport, because other than Wuhan, China, once we stopped people coming to the United States from there, and that did a great job of containing the virus, we allowed everyone to come home from vacation in Europe. And Italy and Spain being two prominent countries, but really, Europe alone, and other parts of Asia, for that matter, that weren't China. So had we been able to be as strict with those travelers as we were with the Chinese travelers, we might have actually delayed the onset of this to an even greater degree in this country, 
and may have actually been able to keep it out in some way to a much greater degree than we have it now. And clearly we see that we're approaching 100,000 deaths in the country. We're way over a million people infected. Uh, so it is here, and unfortunately it is here to stay. So we weren't able to do containment so effectively in the beginning, though we did try as a state, but we quickly had to evolve to what are called non-pharmaceutical interventions, which are mitigation strategies, knowing the virus is here, how to lessen its impact in some way and try to reduce the spread to the greatest degree possible, knowing we have no treatment for it and no current, uh, currently available vaccine for it. So the mitigation strategies, of course, began early with trying to restrict visitation to high-risk populations like nursing homes and hospitals and correctional facilities, quickly evolved into reducing mass gathering size from regular gathering to 250 to 100 to pretty soon 10 people, um, to very quickly uh, shutting schools down, to closing restaurants and bars, to uh, changing the whole context of the healthcare system and how we interacted with the healthcare system. And then um, pretty quickly evolving into stay home, stay safe. The ultimate social distancing strategy because you're now home with your family and nobody else and you wander out to go to the supermarket maybe um, and you're not even going to work. Either you, your job doesn't exist anymore or you're teleworking or what have you. It was incredibly effective, and we did all that in a very narrow time frame, as it turns out, though it seems like it was a long time ago. We're talking about the middle of March when all of this really got going, barely over two months ago. It shows how time has flown by. And that strategy has worked very well. But keep in mind, most of the strategy was how to do proper hygiene. In other words, wash your hands forever and ever, and don't touch your face. Um, how to do respiratory etiquette, meaning don't cough in people's faces, cough in your elbow, et cetera. And then how to be what I like to call not socially distanced, but physically distanced, knowing that six feet is, seems to be the right measure, although we can talk about that later. And it, for most of that time period, facial covering or masking wasn't even a part of the strategy. And we did it all without that. And then when facial covering seemed to be a more solidly evidence-based strategy, we as a country and we in Vermont adapted it. Uh, and now we're, we're using it. That's kind of how we got where we are. How are we doing? I'm not, I'm a modest person, but we are doing phenomenally well. Um, and we only have to look uh, at us compared to the region and the country to understand that. We now have the second lowest rate of uh, infectivity of the virus and rate of positivity of our tests for the virus mm -hmm. in the country. I think Hawaii may be the only other state that's doing better and Montana is not close behind. Um, so if you look at certain metrics, we're doing well. We, we don't have a lot of virus present in the population right now in terms of people saying they feel lousy and test positive for it. We don't even have a lot of people saying they feel lousy. So when you look at what we call syndromic surveillance, how many people are complaining of symptoms of COVID-19, or even just how many are complaining about the flu, um, those are down to very, very low levels. One or 2% of the population of Vermont reporting to an urgent care center or an emergency room complaining of those symptoms. We are doing very well with regard to uh, our our hospital system. We did not ever reach the point where there was such a surge in demand that we overwhelmed the capacity of the hospital systems so that indeed anybody who was ill with COVID to the point where they needed to be in a hospital bed, an ICU bed, or on a ventilator, all could do that without any concern that we were overwhelming the system's capacity. And now things have quieted down so much, we've actually opened up the healthcare system to some of those elective procedures and office visits that weren't having before. So the other part we're doing very well is in that we couldn't have done earlier is we have capacity to test people. 
We have such capacity that we're trying to generate even more people getting tested by having pop-up sites all throughout the state. One will come to near you at any time. They're all over the place and they're attracting three, 400 people each time. We have enough test materials to collect specimens and to process the specimens so that we get a lab result. And we have what's called contact tracing capability. Once we find a case, that person gets isolated. Our epidemiology staff talk with them intensively and are able to do tracing of people who may have been in contact at a higher risk of getting the infection. And that's how the future looks. We're going to continue to need to test widely, identify cases, contact trace, and then quarantine anybody who we contact traced so that we don't ever let disease spread. If we find a um, site in one community that has disease, we can stamp it out quickly with that approach. That is indeed the containment approach. So uh, that's really been a good thing. But that leads me to what is the new normal? Well, the new normal doesn't mean we just keep looking for disease. The new normal means we do all the things I said before. We practice respiratory etiquette. We practice good hand hygiene and total hygiene. We continue to physically distance ourselves and not get into crowded situations where that's not possible. And we continue to use spatial coverings as a primary mode of reducing our ability to infect somebody else. That new normal is going to go on all through this calendar year, and I don't know how much longer. Um, so we have to sort of just suck it up and realize this is where we're at. Um, that is the way of the future. Um, strategy to get back to a, a new normal that is like the old normal before COVID. Well, you've, uh, if you've been watching the press conferences and reading the news about what the uh, governor and I and others in the uh, administration are doing, the bottom line is, using the governor's analogy of turning the spigot, we are proceeding way more slowly than how we got here, because we got here very quickly, but way more slowly and deliberately in a very phased approach, if you will. And that phased approach is really meant uh, to be cautious and to respect the virus and to understand that this virus has the power to do exactly what it did before once again. Some of our caution, uh, and uh, in, if, for those who didn't see the press conference today, because I fully don't expect people all to be watching TV at that time of day, um, some of that caution is because of the region. If we now start looking at the same metrics I described in Vermont to New Hampshire, Maine, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, Quebec, sometimes we find very frightening things. Because every state's at a different stage in their uh, evolution with this di uh, uh, virus. So some of these states actually have um, significant numbers of deaths still occurring on a daily or weekly basis significant numbers of new cases, and we're not talking tens, we're talking hundreds of new cases every week uh, and sometimes every day. Um, and, and sometimes their hospital capacities are being challenged as we speak. So they are far from out of the woods. And as we know, you just have to go one, two, three hours away from the middle of our state, and you're in one of these places where there's a lot going on. So that's why we've been very cautious about reopening the borders, having Vermonters want to travel to go places and come home, um, because there's so much going on that is not typical of the viral level in Vermont right now. So this opening of the spigot has been very deliberate and slow, but it's still similar to how we got here. In terms of mass gatherings, you know, we started with just being with your family and staying home, now it's like, well, maybe another family that you trust, a trusted household who practices the same way you practice to try to avoid contracting the disease um, can come over for dinner or you can be socially out with them. Um, nice weather. We clearly don't want people sitting in their houses. We want them to get outside and just mentally benefit from that, never mind physically in every other way. Um, 
So increasing the size of mass gatherings, you know, right now it's 10. We're on the verge of thinking about 25, and we'll see where we go from there. And then that dictates what kind of um, things can be open or not open. So obviously, we started with you, can, you have to go to a grocery store, you have to be able to get gas, you have to be able to do certain errands that uh, if we close them down, people would suffer like pharmacies. Um, but now we're talking about what's the size of a retail establishment and can we maintain a capacity in that establishment that respects physical distancing but allows people to go back and shop in these places and allows these places to remain in business and uh, do well economically. So that has been happening all along as well. We are now looking at what I would call more close contact situations like one-on-one -on -one in a doctor's office one in one in a elective surgical procedure or even a hospital surgical procedure? And how do we allow people to do that safely? And as you may have heard today, how do we allow people to go to the dentist safely? How do we allow people to get a haircut safely? How do we allow people to think about going back to their gyms or what have you? Um, so all of these kinds of professions need to be reopened on a very phased uh, direction and, and schedule, and that's what we're trying to do with that. Um, and eventually, we'll get to the point where we may have larger mass gatherings. People may be able to go to a wedding and it has 100 people in it, who knows? But will those 100 people have to be Vermonters or will they be relatives and friends from out of state? That will be determined by all the data we're following, not just from our state, but from the entire region and other states. And if you look around the country, you'll see there are states like in the South that just started opening things left and right, even when their disease burden was what we would regard as very high. And they started opening things like schools even very early, where we look at schools as one of the last things that you could open in a safe manner. Um, and then you look at countries around the world and you see all kinds of different experiences. So we will benefit from learning from how things go with some of these states and some of these countries. And hopefully they will learn from looking at us and how we've done as we do things in our own Vermont manner. <laughs> the last thing I promise to talk about before we get to questions and answers is what the future might bring. And um, I was on a phone call with other state health officials just at the beginning of this week and Director Redfield from the CDC was on. And Director Redfield is a virologist by profession. Uh, he's a physician who specializes in viral illnesses and he understands viruses like COVID-19, even though none of us ever saw this virus before. Um, he's fully committed to saying that he sees the resurgence coming in the fall in this country. Not everyone else speaks with that level of certainty or confidence, and he has no data to back it up. It's just his sort of gut feeling, I think, based on science as well. Um, others feel that there are multiple scenarios that could play out where we'll see many resurgences on a regular basis for quite a while, off and on, off and on. Uh, others feel that it's coming later than the fall, maybe in the winter. But everybody feels that while we're in a nice state of, the, of suppression of virus now, that there will be a resurgence of some sort sometime. And the whole goal of our uh, strategy now, if I could call it that, is not only to reopen the economy and reopen the state uh, in as safe a way and methodical a way as possible, but to try to do that, hoping and praying that at some point during that continuum, there will indeed be antiviral therapies that are so effective that we'll feel much more comfortable about the fact that so-and-so got the virus because we can actually help them, not just support them through the illness. And hopefully we'll have a vaccine at the end of it all that will allow us to be safe and protected for the future. And the vaccine front is moving very fast. It's never moved as fast as it's moving now, but I wouldn't want people to take speed uh, and a few positive early reports as something that would make them feel so comfortable that by December, we're gonna be all getting vaccinated. But that's not usually how it works. And it takes a lot longer to do the appropriate testing of uh, vaccines for not only their efficacy, but for their safety. So um, it will come, but I'm not sure it'll come that soon. 
the one nice thing about this virus is it doesn't appear to be mutating uh, at a great rate so that it makes it easier to do a vaccine um, and get the right antibody response because not, you're not dealing with a moving target, so to speak. So let me stop there because I think that's been my 15 to 20 minutes of general comments. Um, probably 15, I guess. And uh, I will let you guys moderate or do whatever you do to make this work. Okay, thank you. And we'll, Brian will turn on mics. I believe there's a few people with their hands up that want to ask some questions. There are. Uh, so just a reminder, please raise your hand uh, if you're on the app. Uh, and if you're on calling in by phone, uh, the key to raise your hand is star nine. And then I'll unmute people. Okay, Walter, you're up first. Okay, there you go. Thank you. Uh, your uh, title of being, quote, a rock star doctor is well deserved. Um, I've watched many of the uh, news conferences, and you do put things in very clear and understandable uh, terms. Uh, you can always keep talking about the state. Um, you know, there's the old joke, Burlington is so close to Vermont. Have you ever thought about bifurcating the state? Here in the kingdom, we seem to have much lower rates. Is it possible to be turning the spigot quicker, faster in our neck of the woods versus other places? I know in New York, the governor's opened up the upper part of the state versus the city. Have you looked at the data or is it just too difficult to do that in Vermont? Yeah, no, I, I appreciate this question. So obviously Chittenden County has one of the highest rates, um, but there are some of the Southern counties that also have significantly higher rates. And then of course, Grand Isle and the very Northeast counties have the lowest rates. Um, one thing we have talked about and fear for the state is that we will have as a state a low rate and then people come across the borders and all of a sudden we no longer are in control of our destiny, so to speak. Um, I would worry about that in Vermont from a regional basis too. Northeast Kingdom is known for some great recreational activities, some great outdoor activities. Um, would you want people to say, it's a safe place for me to go from Vermont, not across the state border, um, and let's all go to do our fishing, our hunting, our whatever in the Northeast Kingdom. And suddenly we find the rate in the Northeast Kingdom is suddenly approaching that of another part of the state that was higher. Um, so you have to have that kind of a little bit of a reservation if you do that, because if the Northeast Kingdom is the only place you can book a hotel in Vermont now, um, let's just say that hypothetically, and people want to get away for a weekend or a week or what have you, uh, why wouldn't they preferentially go there and uh, perhaps unwittingly vector in the virus that you've been avoiding in the Northeast Kingdom all this time? So I think we have to have those kinds of thoughts and considerations as well. Right. So while we might really help the economy of the Northeast Kingdom temporarily, we might actually introduce disease and bring it to a level that um, ends up causing them much more trouble than they bargained for. Um, does that sound clear? Uh, I'm not making excuses for that kind of approach. It's just, you know, what we should do. In New York State, they've got the city, which is so disastrous right now. But there are places like Rochester in upstate New York that are doing well. And I think Cuomo's right. He should be able to change things in that kind of way for that kind of a large state. I just think in Vermont, we're kind of small, we're, we're accessible to each other, people get you know, to different parts of the state readily, and we would actually end up perhaps changing the complexion of certain areas just because people would travel to them. That's all I'll, I'll say on that. I would agree to you to a certain extent, but at the same time, I don't see Burlington rushing up to Johnson to get a haircut. And so no. I could see where the spigot could be turned in certain sectors of the economy. Hotels, I can see your point. Getting a haircut, yeah, I start disagreeing with you a little bit, but that's why I just say state versus regional. If we, there's ways we can bifurcate the state. 
Yeah. Uh, I know yeah. we're a small state, so it's difficult. Yeah, it turns out to be very challenging, but uh, you, you're, you're thinking well. This is good. Thank you, doctor. Great. Thank you, Walter. Uh, Beth, I've got you up next. Okay, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Dr. Levine. It's very much appreciated. Um, my question is around immunity. Um, I, we had heard some reports that there were some concerns around immunity for infected people and that the antibodies may not protect against COVID if they're exposed again. I'm curious what the latest is on those findings and if um, what you can share around that. Yeah, so the latest is unfortunately not much different than a couple of weeks ago. And we still don't have a clear conception of, we know that we can form antibodies against the virus because we have testing now for, on blood that will show people have formed antibodies. We don't know yet how protective those are. So we would think if we base it on other viruses, that having those antibodies would be protective and be a good thing. But we don't know that for certain. We know that with other coronaviruses that are much less harmful than this coronavirus, they usually cause colds, you can get reinfected throughout your life with those same viruses. Um, not going to have severe illness, but you're not totally immune just because your body produced antibodies after one uh, exposure to it. The way we're going to learn more is these trials that are going on where people donate their blood. They take the plasma from the blood. If there are antibodies in the plasma, because these people who are donating already had the infection, those antibodies then get used to try to help a sick person with COVID and see if they get better. That's not being done routinely. That's being done only in trials, investigations. And so we will learn soon some preliminary data anyways, that if pooling those antibodies and, uh, and then infusing them into a person who's really sick will have an impact on the course of their disease. So I don't think we're too far off from understanding that better, but it's a little too early to, to give you as good an answer as you'd like to have. Thank you. Uh, and then I've got a question from the chat. Um, See from Scott Meyer, he asks, uh, we have a question on services potentially contaminated with COVID-19. The CDC has said that this is not a large risk. However, the World Health Organization still has concerns. What is your take? Yeah, you know, I, I got asked this today at the um, press conference too. And it's a tough one to answer. You hate to have these big organizations not completely on the same page. Uh, that's never a good thing. Um, but one thing I can tell you for certain is I think we've gotten very preoccupied with surfaces to the point where we should be much more preoccupied about wearing a mask than about surfaces. Because 95 plus percent of people who get sick with this virus did not get it from a surface. They got it from another person um, and from the respiratory droplets that were in the air around that person. So if only 5% or less of all infections are coming from surfaces, sure, there's work we can do to try to prevent that, but obviously it's never been a predominant way of getting it. You know, if you look at you know, um, gastrointestinal viruses that make you sick and vomit and diarrhea and all that, most of that's hand to mouth. So we know that touching something gave you the virus and uh, then it caused sickness in you. COVID, it's just not that way for most people. 95% of the time, it's through respiratory droplets. So the thing we don't know about surfaces and that the CDC was weighing in on is, often we can measure the virus on a surface, but measuring a virus and knowing if it's viable, if it's still a healthy enough virus to infect someone is really the concern. And it turns out a lot of times that it's on a surface, yes, we know it's there, but actually, if you uh, acquired it from the surface, it probably wouldn't be in the right quantity or in the right state of viability to infect you. So we can throw all the Clorox on it we want and feel good about that, but it probably wasn't gonna be a big problem for us anyway. 
Now, I don't want you to think I'm telling you don't worry about environmental hygiene, as we call it all, because certainly as we talk about opening schools up and things of that sort, and opening hotels up and you know group settings, we do have to be very concerned that not everybody's touching the same door handle, faucet, et cetera, some of those high frequency places, but we should be much more concerned about physical distancing and wearing masks. Thank you. All right, uh, Shane, I've got you up next. Hi, doctor, thank you for being here. Um, I wanna echo what everyone else is saying about how great it's been to you know see your leadership throw this and, and the, the, the steady hand uh, that you've had through this has been very, very good to watch. Um, but I wanted to ask you about, a couple of days ago, the CDC came out with some guidelines on reopening schools. And in the days since then, there's been some misinformation floating around on social media about how those are going to be applied. And so I kind of wanted to, I wanted to get your uh, perspective on what you are looking at in reopening schools, what the requirements are going to be from your end, um, and, you know, what some, we just clear up some of that misinformation that has been floating around in those, those images. Sure. So to be clear, even the CDC lists schools as one of those last things that you start to open. You know, they, they have phase one, phase two, phase three. We're very solidly now in phase two, which is a good place to be. We think we're on the threshold of phase three, which is an even better place to be. And schools don't get opened until phase three in most of the CDC materials. Uh, so you've already got to have a lot of things going on that are good to get to that point. Um, the part about schools that I think we should focus on is, you know, people are more prone to focus on the harm of opening schools, thinking that, oh, all these kids are vectors for disease, um, all their teachers are gonna get sick, their parents are gonna get sick, uh, it's gonna spread through the community, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and when they think that way, they ignore the, the harms of not opening schools. What is it doing uh, to the academic potential of the kids? What is it doing to their development as kids at whatever stage uh, the age they're at and getting to the next uh, milestone, et cetera. What is it doing to them emotionally and socially in terms of their development? And unless we weigh all those things together, I think it comes out very one-sided uh, and the virus wins in, in a sense. And, and the last thing we want is for the virus to win when it shouldn't win. Uh, and so I think uh, our approach is going to be a very multidisciplinary approach. Before this uh, Zoom meeting, I was on the phone with, uh, at an, another Zoom meeting actually, with the Secretary of Education, Dan French, with my uh, head of my developmental kid division, maternal child health, with our state epidemiologist, and with several of the other agency and education uh, officials. And we were all beginning that brainstorming process integrating in what we were reading in a fairly rapid time frame because it just came out from the CDC, other documents for more education-driven or organizations, and talking about forming more of a larger panel and task force that has some of these other expertises in it, pediatricians, child psychologists, um, people with the backgrounds that could weigh in intelligently on some of these other features. Um, but having said all that, I think the main theme, and the CDC does this very well, is not only how to clean the surfaces, but all of the structures that need to be set up in the school of the future and how it's gonna be different than the school of the past and how you actually allow everyone to learn, even though you may not fit the same number in the classroom, they have to be sit seated in a different way, some of them will be at home uh, on a different kind of platform learning that way. Um, how do you feed them in the school? Uh, what role does the school nurse have and how do you do uh, control of who's entering the school and making sure they're well and not sick uh, and gonna infect other people? So many features and so many factors, but I would submit none of them are unsurmountable. And if we take them all into consideration, the kids will benefit. There may still be, in the end, a core of parents that cannot deal with the concept of having their kid go to an environment like that, no matter how safe we try to make it. Um, 
and that's fine. I mean, every, you know, free choice for everyone. But at the same time, I think there's going to be a lot of parents who feel comforted by the fact that we've paid a lot of attention to this and really tried to be as uh, adherent to not only the guidelines, but to more common sense into all of these other features I've tried to build in so that in aggregate, we'll come out with some very sound decisions. And our hope is if this summer is fingers crossed, knock on wood, as smooth as it can be with the virus and it stays suppressed, we'll be positioned very well to open schools and keep them safe for a longer period of time. Thank you. All right, uh, Elizabeth Perry, I've got you up next. Okay, go ahead. Um, yes, thank you, Dr. Levine, again. I will echo everyone else's praise for your response to this pandemic. Um, I would like to know if there are any means available for people who test positive, but they have family members who do not test positive, for those people to isolate elsewhere and for the contacts of these people who have to quarantine, is there any way that those people can quarantine away from their families so that these familial clusters don't crop up? Yeah, great questions. So when this pandemic began, it seemed, and I think we we're all misled, that people and families seemed to do okay. They weren't getting uh, infected at this higher rate uh, when one person had gotten infected. Uh, I've quickly moved to the other end of the spectrum with that, and it turns out that there's plenty of times we find a husband-wife pair. One gets sick, but they stay at home. The other one gets sick at the same time. Occasionally, an entire family gets ill. Um, and so I'm more and more convinced that unless you can isolate yourself in your home, very effectively, your own room that you don't leave and the door is closed, your own bathroom that no one else uses, people leaving food outside the door, you know, very rigorous, um, which is apparently what Chris Como did on CNN and even his wife got infected. But unless you can do that really rigorously, it's really hard to not uh, give everybody else in your family the illness. So I think we need to do a better job as a society in uh, allowing people to isolate, but making isolation something that we incentivize rather than um, make look really bad. Because, you know, if you could have a nice hotel room and it was your room and nobody else there and you had your own bathroom and you had your TV and you had your reading and what have you and people were delivering things to you so that you didn't starve to death and you had entertainment and what have you, um, it's not the ideal. People want to be home, but at the same time, at least it's something that you could say they're doing it well, uh, and and uh, I, I could do that and protect my family. Um, I don't think we've really had that to a large degree in the state right now. We've had some sites like you know the fairgrounds in Essex Junction. We now have a place in Menden that's a, a former ski resort. Um, but we don't have widespread and conveniently located uh, as much of that in the state. And so we've raised it as an issue in our own uh, weekly meeting, not weekly, three times weekly meetings, and are trying to problem solve around it so that we can be prepared if there is another resurgence that we would be able to offer people isolation and they would look at it favorably rather than, ah, I don't think so. Uh, I don't want to take you up on that. So I think that's what we need to do to really make this work well. We don't want to get to be like some of the Asian societies where they actually tell you, you are leaving your home and you're going here. Um, I don't think that's the culture here in the country or in the state, but at the same time, we need to make it an option that people would be enticed by. And um, I think that's the work we still have to do, to be honest. So thank you um, for that. And I had another question um, about antibody testing. I know that um, there has been some talk about antibody testing 
but is there a program statewide for surveillance of the population to find those asymptomatic people who have recovered um, or the pre well, the recovered people. So yeah. speak to me about antibody testing. Yeah, so stay tuned. stay tuned is the answer. I, I did uh, collect a work group, which uh, a month ago gave me an initial report, which was not favorable. They just got back together and I'm waiting for their final report. Uh, preview of that is gonna be that Previously, we didn't think there were any valid instruments to use, any test platforms that actually give, would give accurate results. Now it appears there are, so that's good news. Second preview is that probably still isn't good enough, and I'll continue my talk about the antibodies I answered in the previous question. Probably not good enough for a person to know if they have antibodies, because we don't know what that means. We still don't know if that means they won't get sick again, we still don't know, mean, know if that means they'd be a good donor. And we still don't know if that means they should have a go back to work card because they now show antibody. Um, so for individual decision making, it's not well known enough to do. Third preview is most likely gonna be, yes, the test is good enough to now randomly sample a bunch of our population so we can do some surveillance and understand how much of the population in Vermont has been afflicted by the virus, even if they didn't know about it. And that will help as we do future planning, and that will help as we uh, figure out when there is a vaccine, uh, how to deliver that to the population effectively. Um, and that will take a lot of work to arrange such a study, but we feel comfortable that during the course of this summer, we will be able to do that kind of a study. Hopefully with the help of the CDC, and some funding from the CDC, but that remains to be seen yet. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. All right, uh, Mark Woodward. Okay, Mark, go ahead. Thank you for being here. Um, my concern is, what are, you, what are you thinking around the college opening back up? Because we have the college in Johnson, we also have a studio center, which brings in people from all over the world. And my sense is they're planning to open this fall. And I'm wondering whether that's r real or what you're, that's, that's a whole new world when we start bringing a thousand new people into Johnson from out of town. Absolutely. So uh, we've been in discussions with both the college and the studio center. And I actually have a weekly call with all the health centers at colleges all across the state. Um, and the bottom line is you're right, it's a whole new world. Um, many colleges, both in state and in the country, have already said, we don't think this is a wise thing, we don't think we're going to open. Others, like the University of Vermont and many colleges around the country, have said, we think we're going to open. Um, so you have both sides. Um, but we all know that colleges bring people in from all over the place, and that, as I said in my talk about the region, can be a concern. Um, it's not a concern that should forbid them from opening because you can quarantine people and test people and try to keep everyone else safe, if you will, by doing that. But that takes a lot of advanced planning as well. <laughs> and then college, of course, is a time when not all the 19 to 20 year olds uh, are listening to anybody uh, or are conforming to the behaviors you'd like them to conform to. So we have to consider that. But then just like with public schools and uh, elementary schools, um, they won't look the same, these colleges. So what used to be a large lecture in a large lecture hall probably will be delivered remotely because you can't get all those people together in a large lecture hall. And the course that used to be a small seminar course in a small classroom will probably sit in the lecture hall so they can all be appropriately spaced apart and still benefit. There's also concerns that a great number of the faculty are much older than 19 to 20 year olds and might actually fall in the category of being more vulnerable just by age alone. And we have to be uh, very considerate of that and their uh, anxiety about entering an environment where um, they could contract the disease much more readily if they didn't enter the classroom at all. 
And then you have all these concerns about what's a dormitory going to look like. Well, you know, in UVM, they've been having triples uh, for the freshman dorms. I can't imagine three people coming to live in a freshman dorm room uh, with, a, with a bathroom that they share with other rooms in the era of COVID. That just does not make sense. And of course, that requires a lot of planning if you're going to bring on the number of students that usually come on campus. So they've got to problem solve around things like that as well. So I guess what I want to say for my answer to you is, I'm not closed on the concept of starting college. I think that we could probably do that in select ways, but it will be very different. There'll have to be a very different uh, adherence to a lot of strategies that no one's used to or accustomed to adhering to. And it will be just very different than we've ever done before. Um, and it will require the healthcare systems in all of these colleges, the student health centers and the community health apparatus to really be prepared and geared up for anything that might happen. Because we do know that it's kind of like the analogy of a correctional facility is like a cruise ship. The people in that facility are there and the disease comes in and whatever happens, happens until you get a hold of it and contain it. Well, I would consider a college campus to be somewhat similar to that. And then when we think about how many people in the community access the campus and how many people in the campus access the community, um, you've got to have a really solid public health plan in place before you even begin to say that this is going to happen. But I think it is possible. Um, and we will be instructed by experience in other states and other countries and by where the virus is as the summer goes on. You have a right to have all the concerns you have, but some of them can be dealt with. Hi, excuse me, this is Lee. I'm from Northern Vermont University, and I do want to uh, reiterate what Dr. Levine says. Um, we are, uh, our Dean of Student Life meets with him regularly and reports back to us, and I can assure you that we are working through a variety of plans. Um, our goal, our, we plan to open in the fall, um, looking at face-to-face -face instruction, but we also know that it will not look the same as to what we are all used to, but we're talking through a variety of scenarios, uh, many of which Dr. Levine mentioned, um, as to what would work, what would be appropriate. The goal is to ensure the, the, the safety of our students as well as the safety of our community. But those, a variety of plans will be developed and will be communicated out um, later this summer. Thanks for adding that in. Thank you. We appreciate the guidance. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, and I've got Rick Opperly. And uh, Greta, I do see you with your hand up. I'll, I'll have you up right after Rick. Okay. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing your time with us and Jonathan. Um, Western medicine tends to look at things uh, from a body and mind, or body or mind perspective. So my question is um, a year ago, uh, we were at Lamoille Union, uh, Green Mountain Tech Center, we were talking about the opioid summit and about, um, uh, well, the community response to uh, Jenna's promises is, is, is admirable. And uh, going forward, I, the question, uh, I know we're talking about virology a lot and about the body, but uh, how is the state um, looking at balancing resources regarding mental health issues? Because I think that's going to be part of the, if you will, lateral damage of the physical illness. Oh, absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, I am heartened by the fact that we have not seen the rates of uh, domestic abuse reports, suicides, uh, depression that uh, are being reported in many other locales. Um, but still, this is very real for everybody. We did actually obtain some federal grant money, our Department of Mental Health and our Department of Health together, uh, to deal with some of these mental health issues in this era of COVID, and to deal with some of the substance use issues that are challenged by just having COVID around. Um, and so we've actually uh, felt really good about that. 
we're just like we're opening up lots of healthcare sectors, we're also opening up the mental health sector. Turns out that sector can work pretty well with telehealth and telephone health because um, it's more people talking to one another, they don't have to lay hands on another. But at the same time, um, it's often very therapeutic for someone to be more directly connected to someone than on a screen. Um, we are spending a lot of energy working with our Department of Mental Health colleagues with all of your concerns in mind. Uh, it's really challenging. Um, it's become a little less challenging as we've sort of opened that spigot and come out of our houses, so to speak. And it's not so much stay at home as much as stay safe. Um, so I think that's going to help everyone. I think we're benefited by the fact that we now have good weather and there is always a seasonal component to some of this. So fortunately, we're not stuck in the middle of the winter. I think that would really compound um, all of the mental health issues that we're talking about here. Um, so I think that some of that weather is gonna be a favorable factor. Really, really good. We do know that people are purchasing more alcohol than they did previously. Um, doesn't mean they're using it unhealthy, but at the same time, we have to keep our eye on that. Um, we also know that um, we've seen that people with some other uh, substance use disorders like opioid use disorder um, have been able to remain connected. We still have been able to offer them treatment. They can still access treatment. Um, and they even can get prescriptions far more readily than they could previous to this without all the restrictions that might have surrounded that interaction. So um, there are some good things that are, we're learning about uh, that I think will inform us for the future as well. Thank you. Okay, Greta, uh, you're up. Hi. Okay. Go ahead. So I'm thinking about um, like personal and protective gear for like for workers. Like, is the state doing anything to like get lots of gear for people so everyone can like even at high risk people can go back to work? Maybe wear I don't know N95s or something. And um, the other thing I'm thinking about is uh, the far UVC lighting and like HEPA filtration. I'm I'm wondering if it's possible to put um, far UVC lighting and like HEPA fil filtration systems like at schools and businesses. Um, I, I've seen that the far UVC lighting has been approved recently by the FDA to um, kill the virus in the air um, and just to help keep the air clean. So when people are in uh, enclosed rooms with other people, um, it keeps the numbers of the virus down. Um, so yeah, I'm wondering if that's like something that's maybe possible. Well, on, on your second question, I can confidently say I don't know enough about it to, to weigh in. Um, and I, I can tell you lots of things that are FDA approved or approved now under emergency use authorization, so-called EUA. And that's why we ran into trouble with so many of the tests we use to see if people are infected because well, those tests got an EUA because we needed to have testing capability quickly. They weren't the most accurate tests. Um, so I, I'm always cautious on this front, um, uh, but I don't know enough about the, the, uh, the uh, lighting to, to, to weigh in on it. But with regard to the uh, PPE, so the state is rebuilding its stockpile uh, because we need to. And it has been way more accessible, with the exception of gowns that had a slight issue in the last couple of weeks, but we think is improving. Um, we've been able to gain what we need uh, to start rebuilding that stockpile and to continue to uh, deliver it to sites that request it, like physician offices, like long-term care facilities, uh, FQHCs, et cetera. So all of that is happening and ongoing. The only issue is uh, we're finding that um, these kind of individual use requests are very challenging. Um, most people um, who are, you know, I, if I could call it more vulnerable, 
probably should not be putting themselves in the situations that you're suggesting they put themselves in, um, even if they feel more secure with the mask, uh, just because they are still vulnerable. And as we know, the mask protects others from you more than it protects you from others. So it's more of a generous thing we're doing to help others by wearing the mask than it's helping us as much. But I do understand N95s work way more effectively than the traditional cloth coverings, but I wouldn't want people to be falsely reassured and put themselves in, in the danger if they truly have one of those illnesses that they shouldn't allow themselves to be in those situations. So Brian, we're uh, now over an hour, probably ought to take one more question and then we'll yeah. move on. Okay. So Janice has been waiting very patiently here. All right. Uh, I'm sorry, Janice. I'm not able to unmute you. All right. Out of uh, respect for Dr. Levine's time, I think uh, we're probably going to have to cut it off. Um, I apologize for the technical issue here. Hey, you waited the entire time to have one, so that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> And I saw that uh, on the little um, list of people that the uh, Tatros were in the audience. So I just want to again uh, say hello to them and uh, show my appreciation for all they've done for the region of the state. Um, it's just wonderful. And uh, carry on, please. <laughs> Okay, I guess with that, uh, first of all, I wanna thank you, Dr. Levine, for Zooming in tonight. Uh, the next part of our program is uh, some local entertainment. A, a musician will be paint, playing a couple of songs. You're more than welcome to stay, but uh, this is how we do it every week. We end with a little entertainment for everyone, a little mental health along with the physical health. I, I'll try to multitask and listen to the music at the same time. But I appreciate okay. your inviting me, and I hope it's been useful and helpful for you all. Yep. Thank it's been you. extremely Thank useful. Thank you, Doctor. Stay, stay well. So with that, we'll turn it over to Lisa from the Rec Committee, Rec Coordinator. OK, Lisa, go ahead. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Dr. Levine. Um, we don't have too much to report tonight on Rec. I think in the interest of time, we'll um, sort of skip over a few things and race to the music. Um, the annual Memorial Day 5K that we run each year has been canceled this year. Obviously we can't join in a large group, but because May is virtual race month, if you find yourself out completing a walk, hike, bike, or run 5K on Monday, please email Johnson Recreation. Um, the email is on our website and let me know that you completed it and we'll enter your name in the monthly raffle drawing for our virtual races. Next week at the end of our meeting, we will be doing the Johnson results of the Johnson Family Feud survey that is out and that will go out a few more times this week on um, Front Porch Forum and Facebook. So please fill out the answers to that so we can all um, enjoy a little bit of entertainment through some of the questions and see what everybody's been up to during this time at home. Um, Autumn Chamberlain, an NVU student, um, is joining us again. She's back by popular demand. She'll be doing two songs for us tonight. So thank you, Autumn. You're very welcome, Lisa. Thank you for inviting me back here. I'm glad that people uh, enjoyed me so much that they uh, demanded that I return. Uh, so yeah, I am a, a student at NVU Linden in the music business and industry program, and I've got a couple original songs today. Uh, the first one I'm going to be sharing with you guys is called Stars and Clovers, and I hope you enjoy it. Let me know if it's if the guitar is too loud or anything. Nothing in this world could ever set me free. I can't believe that I could feel 
so blue But in that random moment The moment was so long ago Occurring only far between it you You are feel Feel so weak Like I'm breathless and left us But it was not something I feel The part that hurts the most Never seems to show I feel like I can't depend on stars And clovers anymore I felt so hard and though it hurts I somehow push through I blame myself but it's all because of you But it's all because of you seems to show I feel like I can't depend on stars and clovers anymore I felt so hard and though it hurts I somehow push through I blame myself cause it's all because of the that the never seems to show I know I can't depend on stars and Myself, but it's all because of you. Thank you. Uh, can't hear the applause, but I can see it, so thank you so much for that. Um, the second and final song I'll be sharing today is one that I actually wrote whilst in quarantine as an assignment, but I kind of developed it further into an actual song. Um, it's called Same Old, Same Old, and the, the title is fairly self-explanatory, uh, but it's definitely about monotony and getting bored. Uh, so hopefully you guys can relate to this, given the current circumstances. It's the same old, same old every day Making everything for nothing, just throw it away I'm running out of things to say I'm running out of things to say I can't lie, I haven't moved or even felt okay I've been bad, stuck in my head, feeling no escape My thoughts are all in disarray My thoughts are all in disarray No, I can't rest no more I can't 
can't sleep Cause it keeps me up at night Thinking I've done all that I can do Just wanna keep me close to you That's all right Now I'm a half a snap with broken records Stuck on replay and I hate reiterating But I will if I may I'm running out of things to say I'm running out of things to say You know it's hard to sleep when you pass out at three You wanna hit rewind but end up on repeat That goes on for a week It makes the mind go weak Staying on the up and up and up I'm thinking in my peak So much consistency It doesn't interest me I'm being filled to the brim with insufficiency I need a sweet release So I'll just stop and leave There's no more drinks I'm hiding up my sleep No, I can't rest Can't rest no more I can't sleep Cause it keeps me up at night Thinking I've done all that I can do Just wanna keep me close to you that's all the right It's the same old, same old Every day Making everything for nothing Just throw it away I'm running out of things to say I'm running out of things to say It's the same old, same old Yes, it's the same old, same old Oh, oh, oh. I'm running out of things to say I'm running out of things to say, yeah. I'm running out of things to say. 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 Thank you, Thank Autumn. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you for coming back. Thanks, Dr. Levine, for coming tonight. I hope everyone has a wonderful Memorial Day weekend. Get out there and enjoy it. The weather's supposed to be really nice, really nice. Uh, so until next week, see you all then. Good night. <laughs>